let's get started. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining. This is um, typically this is uh, our fall break week, but it's um, not really a break, uh, as we know, because the both the staff and students and many faculty also are very involved in a lot of the career ID uh, activities. Um, but uh, with this, I really want to welcome everyone to the Institute of Design at IIT for the fall 2021 career ID event. Um, and this is a confab conversation. Uh, and confab means it's an informal conversation or discussion that we've been giving to our um, biannual career fair and gathering uh, in which we talk to many professional practice partners. Uh, my name is Laura Forlano. I'm a social scientist and design researcher and associate professor at ID. Um, and this year, uh, the Career ID event is hosting organizations such as Booz Allen, CVS Health, Northern Trust, Steelcase, and Salesforce. So tonight, um, we are going to be talking about the future of work. And I'm joined uh, by Emanuela uh, Ben Ovo a current MDES and MBA a dual degree student at ID that many of you might know, and Teddy Smurhall, the Global Vice President of Design and Innovation at Salesforce. Uh, so the way we're gonna start uh, the evening is that first Teddy will be uh, giving a short presentation about uh, his work and how Salesforce is looking at the future of work. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how um, and, and then uh, Manny also has a, a short presentation. And then we're gonna bring these themes together, talking about themes such as the great resignation, uh, the meaning of remote work, the differences among different fields and industries, and in particular, uh, the trends that we're seeing in the field of design. Um, so keep uh, that in mind and, and ask questions again in the chat, as well as in the Q&A. Um, uh, box and we look forward to opening up the discussion uh, later this hour after the presentations and some some of the discussion that we're going to have and with that I will turn it over to Teddy uh, to share the screen and start the presentation. Great. Oh, I got the wrong one. I think. Can you see? Can you see... No Sorry. I see future of work patterns and then uh, six boxes with different themes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll run through these relatively quickly. I'm not going to read everything, um, but I've been working in, in and around this topic for quite some time, both uh, in the kind of social constructs of work, but also in the uh, working with our real estate team and, you know, physical spaces for collaboration in the future of work. So have a pretty good <clears throat> um, broad sense of this. Wonderful. Teddy, um, would it be possible to go to view um, full uh, presentation view? Yep, there you go. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And um, the, the thing that I would want to put out here, you can see on the on the left, this is work that's very recent and from July, um, from some work that I did with, uh, with IDEO where I used to work, just to try and get a sense of, uh, we have a perspective, certainly at Salesforce, IDEO is getting asked this question of what's the future of work, what's hybrid, what's remote, right, by, by a large number of, of, of their customers and ours uh, around the globe. And so we just took a moment to kind of uh, put that into a very simple frame uh, that you see here, these kind of patterns, um, so that we could work with, you know, our senior leadership to try and get their heads around what is really happening um, uh, on the kind of, not just, not just um, at the executive level, but especially down one, one or two levels, and then again, kind of globally. So the first of these is that the kind of employee engagement, right, is becoming a lot more fluid. Um, you'll hear Manny talk a little bit later about kind of gig workers, but like the permeability of the membrane of the organization is, is, is increasing, right? And so you have, um, you know, full-time employers, part-time employees, contractors, gig workers, all working in tandem you know, in varying kind of uh, configurations of, of projects and initiatives. And so um, we're, we're seeing this increasingly, we call it the pixelated workforce. And it's also that, you know, while people are in different configurations, literally, legally, contractually, um, they're all seeking, and right now, especially kind of increasing their own power, autonomy, and equity. Um, and there's a moment in time here where um, with the great resignation, which we'll talk about, you know, labor, if you will, the work, the workforce really has a lot more 
power than, uh, than employers, which is only good news for all of you. The second is, you know, digital first workplace. You'll see this certainly with Salesforce and the acquisition of Slack. Um, but, you know, right now, no one's in the office. And that massive experiment and shift um, has really put, you know, digital first at the forefront, um, where real estate and in-person analog collaboration was really there previously. Um, and so the, the, the shared infrastructure, right, is no longer just, hey, how do we have a vertical, vertical wall space and team collaboration spaces, but what does that look like, you know, when we're sitting in our home offices in the screen and Miro and Figma and the like become, um, you know, more important. You'll hear me, uh, you know, use designer tools. I mean, we're, we're seeing this across our sales organizations and uh, engineers as well, but of course we have a design audience and I, you know, come from that standpoint. So I will kind of tend to, to aim our, our discussion there. Um, the third would be this kind of team as the atomic unit um, where, you know, historically there's been a lot of individual contributor, um, you know, a lot of the infrastructure was really focused on, you know, offices and finding um, uh, spaces where people could do individual work. And really, in general, as the complexity of work increases and um, kind of the fluidity increases, we're really seeing this shift from me to we in terms of the atomic unit that, that the uh, executive suite is, is interested in. Um, the fourth being kind of leading from a distance, um, you know, there's this adage that, you know, people don't really leave uh, organizations, they leave managers. And the, the shift, right, to having to lead or manage from a distance has been, um, has been really significant and very difficult for many leaders who are used to, you know, water cooler chat in the, in the office or being able to, you know, turn around and, talk and see a teammate. And so what does that mean for how leaders build uh, you know, emotional resiliency, trust, and also their own well-being and having to take on some of that uh, in a different and maybe more pronounced way during, uh, during COVID. The fifth of these is, I'm going to come back to, it's a bit more difficult to explain. Um, the, the, fifth, the sixth here is a, kind of a true sense of belonging, right? Um, we talked a little bit about equity early on, but I think we're seeing this very interesting kind of demand um, as people uh, are seeing purpose, right, in their in their work, um, I know especially the younger generations. Manny mentioned earlier, there's kind of a mission-driven sense to this. I think it's only been exacerbated, accelerated uh, by the time at home, people being nearer to family, um, really having moments of time to reflect on what they're doing with their time, and so we're seeing this kind of culture of belonging. Uh, almost kind of step up on uh, a step up a level on top of um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, but but a, but a broader sense of kind of belonging and organizational uh, psychological safety in the in the workplace. This last one is a little bit different um, because it's it's really kind of business model focused, uh, market driven, and we're seeing this work as um, some of this work is from Jeffrey Moore. Um, who J J G E O F F R E Y? He's been a longtime strategist, marketing strategist out in Silicon Valley, and he's looking at the the shift right from historically it was really a product and a supply chain, the back end uh, of the organization that was driving uh, demand and and uh, and sales, and the shift to from front to back really puts the customer and the user up front. This is news. This is music to most of our ears, but it's a fundamental shift that we're seeing in many organizations, not just software organizations, that I think will take time for other functions to get their head around and where design can really help here. And so I'm going to pull these down for a second and just take us into one other um, of kind of transition from those six large themes to what I really feel like is an evolution in the conversation uh, around the future of work that's just started maybe two, three months ago. This is not just amongst, this is, this is certainly what's in the press, right? Well, but also amongst those of us that are kind of watching and, and, and looking at the conversation, especially at the executive levels. The shift is uh, after some missteps, 
right, that have been happening from, I would say, Jamie Dimon and co and others on Wall Street to even Amazon and Apple, right, who have put dates in front of, of employees by when they need to be returning to the office, only to have them move once and maybe again, given Delta and other variants. And so I see, we see those missteps going on, people trying stuff in the market without what we would call proper design research. Um, they're early, there isn't a lot of data coming off of open offices that are prototyping. And so there's a lot of kind of swimming around in this in the ambiguity. And I think partly because of, uh, of where we've been, those missteps, the great resignation, which if you haven't heard, you know, even six months ago was reporting roughly 43% of the workforce wanting to, to quit and change their job. Those figures are now up in the 50s, in the mid 50s, in again, just a couple, just a minute, just a minute of, of months. Um, you saw Schwab uh, post, they're increasing their everyone's, in, everyone's pay by 5% across the board as another, uh, you know, here we're gonna try this. Intuit gave everyone a week off at the same time, not just take a week, but like that comes back into, oh, now I'm feel stressed when I come back in the office, but if everyone's gone at the same time. So we're seeing these little bits of interesting prototyping experimentation in the market. And I believe all of that is actually just now, and again, the last couple of months, really shifted the conversation from, oh my gosh, we're, we've been so productive, right? During the pandemic, we actually can work at home to, oh my gosh, that's really, people are burned out. There's a level of trauma um, in many different places. Um, parent Caregivers, both of parents and, and young children, this renewed sense of purpose and how am I using my time and this uh, employer power, employee power, sorry that I believe the, the combination of those, those four new macro themes, I think is emerging. And we're seeing, again, in the press, more senior executives start to recognize that, I mean, that productivity may have been true, but it came at a real cost. And what's the situation that we're in now? And I believe it's a much more uh, realistic view of the state of the uh, workforce, young workforce, female workforce, um, and certainly female workforce uh, of color, right? And so we're seeing some, again, just a, a new grappling with, I think, a, a, a much more realistic lens than, oh, we can be really productive. And so with that, I, that's kind of the frame up for uh, a bunch of fodder, right, for conversation. Um, Manny's going to talk a little bit about some research that she did, and then we'll walk into a bunch of conver conversation and questions uh, from the chat. But with, you know, uh, Laura have, having done a bunch of research, Manny, some work, and me sitting in you know in the middle of, of a large organization. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank wow, my voice is going through a transition. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you so much, Teddy Teddy. My name is Emanuela Ben Ebel, and um, I'm also a master's student at um, at Illinois Institute of Technology, but specifically the Institute of Design. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Or it's, sorry, it's like raspy, um, but I'm trying my best. <laughs> okay, so over the summer, um, my partner and I worked on the Fjord Masters Challenge, and we were trying to look at the future of recruitment, and everyone knows like the ongoing problem of like trying to find a job in the middle of a pandemic. It is the worst. Um, I can attest to that because I'm also going through that phase right now. Um, so I'm just going to share a little bit about what we worked on um, over the summer and I'm going to be really quick. Um, yeah. um, can everyone see my screen? Uh -oh. Like awesome. Um, yeah. So I'm sure you're all familiar with this statement. Um, when you finally apply for a job or you go for like the first interview and you get an email and it says, Thank you for your interest in our company, but we've decided to go with candidates that closely align with our needs. Um, this happens a lot, but the pandemic just made it worse. Um so a brief introduction, um, this is from someone that we had seen off of YouTube who was just complaining she had a whole YouTube video on just um, the application process. 
Uh, so she says here, you might not believe me, but I would say I've submitted close to 500 different applications. And even at that point, she still didn't have a job. So why is this happening? Um, we're asking ourselves, um, why is it so hard to find a job in the first place? Um, so we decided to look at, you know, what are the key trends? Like what's happening with the future of work? As you well know, um, work has become this thing that is almost synonymous to home because our work has, our workspace has um, come into our homes. So how do you like manage that work-life balance? And so with that, yes, you know, Teddy had mentioned like we had become the most productive um, during the pandemic, but then it also came at a huge cost um, because it came with burnout um, because there's no clear separation between home and work. And so like family mixes with work and it's just like a nice tangled web that we need to un unfold or remove. So what do we need for this new era of work culture? Um, we definitely need collaboration, creativity, communication, and essentially um, problem solving because every single company, large, small, medium, um, is going through the same problem of not knowing what to do next um, because the challenges are, um, are changing as we go. So how do you design for people in a, an ever-changing, ever-competitive job market? Um, and how do you even manage that drop-off where people are now looking for purpose, um, not necessarily finding a job, but finding a company that has a mission or ties back to the values that they hold so strongly. And so with that, um, we noticed that there were two key things that were showing up. Um, this whole thing about, uh, first, freelancing. Um, so then we asked ourselves, is the future of work freelancing? Are people within our generation actually open to the idea of just waking up, um, sitting in your house and then doing your job and then going to see, like having flexible hours and you know traveling to different countries while you're working. You know, I know workation has become a thing. Um, so is that the future of work? Um, TikTok also started this pilot program, which they also launched um, beginning or middle of this year, um, where they were starting to look at video resumes or a new way of like submitting resumes so it doesn't feel like you started this work you put in the resume the cover letter the portfolio you did everything feels like you know this big high fidelity model that you toss to a company and then they're only that then after two weeks you either one don't hear from them or two they tell you we're oh, sorry um you didn't fit what we were looking for so how do we manage this i mean companies aren't wrong for you know stating what they're looking for um, but how do we manage that so with everything that has been going on and um, we decided to focus on gen z's and so we um, noticed this thing called hustle culture where now a lot of gen z's are saying you know what uh, i'd rather not do a nine to five job i'd rather just have my own business my own small e-commerce store but like find my own thing and maybe I could work for a company for two years or five years and then, you know, start my own YouTube channel or my own Twitch, Twitch stream uh, account. So with that, we're saying, okay, so about 61 million Gen Zers are about to enter the workforce, but do we have the capacity to actually fulfill the needs of 61 million Gen Zers? With the current climate, there's a rising competition in the job market, and there's fluctuation in employee behaviors, and we're still unaware of the true consequences of COVID-19 um, or COVID vaccinations. And so there's this great desire to see things go back to normal. Um, however, we are far from normal, and we just have to like design for the new changes. So with that, um, we decided to look into like who is our target audience? And we saw that it wasn't just college students, but even recruiters, because um, you don't necessarily go to school to become a recruiter. You just kind of have to figure it out or be like a good people person or get training within a company. Anyway. And so um, most times a lot of students are like, oh, you know, like job descriptions are ambiguous. I don't know if I'm the right fit. Like there's a clear communication gap. 
And so we started with the problem statement. Recruiters are looking for skills to solve specific and unique problems in your organization, especially from a more experienced workforce. However, Gen Zers are noticing that current educational models are not helping them stand out in this ever-changing competitive job market. Neither is experience. You can't be looking for experience when I have not had experience for two years. So there is a mismatch. Um, if experience is not a good metric for finding great talent amongst Gen Zs, then what is? How might we enable Gen Zers find the right company that suits their skills and their passion for that true purpose? And so I'll just share a brief note. Um, one of the people that we interviewed, he's like, dear recruiter, I wish you could see and understand these things from my perspective. And so these are sort of the guiding principles that we're using to develop this new thing, which I'll announce in a couple, in, in just a few seconds. Um, so he was talking about job descriptions and, but the thing that really stood out was how he said, we should move away from a faceless system and this whole idea of like applying for a job should feel more human. And I was struck by that because, I mean, we say, oh, your resume should have your, your photo because um, we don't want like unconscious bias or like things like that. But are we helping or are we marrying or harming um, our, our, our customers in the process? So with that, me and my partner Tosin, we started Skillset. And so Skillset is loving what you do and doing what you love. Essentially, it is a job site um, that helps you essentially um, just share your skills. So you search for roles based on the skills and interests that you have. And so, you know, I may be someone who is interested in design and I love travel. And I mean, not necessarily um, fit into like a design research role. There may be other things. And even with the market changing, um, what I consider product design today is not what say Teddy considers product design um, right now. And so how do we um, really match or like um, design a better system that helps people find roles um, that are more targeted to what they're interested in and what they're looking for. And so we just did a mock-up but essentially it's a site that helps you um, look into like job descriptions based on what you're interested in or your passions. And then you can compare and contrast in order to stay organized because it's not only recruiters that need to stay organized, students also have to stay organized, even if we're you know, trying to apply for like a hundred companies. Um, and so with the hustle culture and you know, a lot of people having their personal account and their e-commerce or business account. Um, we're like, how can we make a more holistic approach in the sense that, you know, people can actually share their interests or their skills on this site. And so essentially, in a nutshell, we're looking to change the way we view resumes and apply for jobs. Thank you. Okay, thank you both for these wonderful presentations. It really gives us a lot to discuss. Um, we're gonna start off the conversation um, just with a question for uh, Manny to, to ask you what you're most concerned about in terms of coming into the workforce. Um, you've highlighted some of the broader context there. Um, and I wanted to remind everyone to add, add specific questions in the Q&A and then other commentary certainly in the chat. Um, and that will allow us to be able to integrate those into the conversation. So Manny, with that, what are you thinking? I mean, it's uh, Career ID Week and um, what are the things that are top of mind for you? Mm. So the first is I am a pretty, or I like structure in my life. So I definitely will not see myself in that freelancing area. <laughs> I'm looking for like a more stable job for now. Um, but. I'm more concerned about um, how to be like more efficient in finding the job. So like, how can I be more efficient in my search? So I don't end up like that girl who, you know, is applying to 500 companies, but I feel like, you know, there is a better way of, you know, looking for a company that you are also interested in and, you know, your values and that company's values get sort of match. And then also the thing with burnout, like how to manage burnout because that is inevitable. 
work and life have merged so like how do you separate the two although they exist within the same place Wonderful. Teddy, I wonder if you had any thoughts um, in response to, to Manny about how we might um, address some of these concerns. Yeah, I mean, I think on the first one, you know, um, I, I, I heard this, I've, I've heard this, in, in, I don't know, kind of increasingly over the years, right, and around, oh, I have, I have a, a degree that doesn't fit in the box, or I'm a designer, specifically design strategist, and nobody knows what I do, right? And um, I think I think that what what we're seeing, big picture, especially in the kind of uh, from a, from a corporate perspective, right, is that um, we've gotten senior executives to understand that design is not uh, fashion design, it's not furniture design, it's not interior design. Like that's what that's what people thought of as design previously. And we've moved them to the point where they, oh, design is UX, right? But that's not, that's, that's a good thing. That's not a small, that, that, took, that took years, right? For people to understand what, what UX designers or product designers did. So, so, we've, so we've increased their design fluency to a certain degree. What we're seeing now and what part of what my job is, is to, just to, is to help um, senior executives primarily understand what um, like design as a, as a skill set right, as opposed to a function, and one that is really about creativity and iteration and a problem-solving method that is really fundamentally different than most of the way that business operates, right? And so here it is, the design strategist, and that design strategists belong in many different functions, in many different parts of the organization, not just in UX. You, you do want them in product, um, um, next to the UX designers to understand what to build uh, next to research, but you also want them working with your customers and you also want them working in marketing. And I don't say you actually also want them in your, uh, in your legal department and in your finance functions, right? And so I think that this is uh, a, new, a new place for, uh, and, the, and, there's, and there's opportunity. This power brings me to this kind of conundrum, right, of Oh, I'm a liberal arts major, and I don't have, I don't fit in a box. The opportunity there is you get to tell your own story, right? Is that more work? Perhaps, um, but it means that you get to, you, you're the one doing some of the education along the way, and and you get to, um, you get to help someone else understand what it is that you do, and in there maybe lies the match, right? Um, I'm not again product product UX or UI designers. There's, there are many more specific, we heard that specific job descriptions, but we're now seeing design strategy, design strategist um, job descriptions. I would say it's, you know, it's, it's uh, from, a, from a volume perspective, it's still 10 to 20 percent of, of openings that you will see for more specific roles, but especially for, you know, we know ID students um, are, in, in our estimation, tend toward design strategists, toward process, toward organizational. And, you know, we certainly at Salesforce, we know that that's what, what ID is, is looking, it, it, like what, what ID uh, is a very holistic design education as opposed to a UX education. And so, you, like, believe me, you're on our radar and we're hiring, we will be hiring for design strategists. So that's the first thing I would say is that, you know, coming out of a, of a well-known design school, but not an MBA program, Right, you're not going to. You, you may not slot right into, but the opportunity is you get to educate and tell your own story. So that'd be the first thing I'd say. Um, with burnout, um, I don't have I don't have an act. Well, I have a couple ideas. Right, I think that we're just now starting to see the shift or the oper the the opening right to have to not have work be the defining scheduler of our lives, right? That has been the nine to five chunk of time has been the thing that we've been, especially in corporate, right? But like built our schedules and our lives around and that's starting to open up as a possibility to not have that be the case. I'm not sure we know what that is yet, um, but there's an opening, right? For all these reasons that we've talked about. 
Um, some of them, you know, hard with child with care, again, up or down, child care or parental parental care. Um, some with, oh, team agreements that we're going to be online during these hours and the other hours, you do with what you want. You still have eight hours of work to do, but you do it whenever you whenever you please. Um, and we're seeing some corporations, some organizations, let's I'm, I'm put WordPress in that category, who's never had a physical headquarters, right? And so if you look at the way that engineering, for instance, has done their work for, for the better part of a couple of decades, it is highly uh, remote, highly hybrid with GitHub and uh, technologies like Lean and, and Agile. We're, we as a design profession practice, we're a, we're a bit more immature, right? We've demanded historically that we needed to be in person with vertical wall space to work together. And that, so, so that has a legacy. And now we're, we're moving, finally, we've been forced to move, right, to uh, virtual whiteboards. They're not there yet, right? But we're, as a practice, historically just more, less mature than other, than other, other, um, uh, other practices, engineering being one of them. You know, Dennis wrote, a lovely introduction to the Pathways report where he looked at the evolution of the financial practice, right? From accountants to CFOs. And that's, a, that's another evolution of a, of a function or practice that we need to look to as, a design, as designers to say, how does it, what does it look like for us to move from, you know, uh, making things pretty to oh, information architects, to proper UX, to design strategists, to strategists that use design, right? And that's where we're, 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 we're in some flux here that I think is um, encouraging, slower than probably a lot of us would like, uh, and with lots of, lots of lots of opportunity. Thanks so much. That was a great, uh, really comprehensive answer. And Nanny, I wondered if you had a question for us, uh, thinking about some of the other um, aspects of, of uh, the presentation you gave and the concerns that you have. Yeah, so one big one is, um, so like employees right now and even future potential employees are sort of looking for passion and purpose um, in how they spend their time, especially with work. So like, how do, how do we find like possible resolutions or pathways for that? Yeah, and I think with this, I might um, jump in to, you know, sort of move from a bit of a moderator to also participate a bit in the conversation. And one of the questions I would have as someone who's, you know, deeply involved in the sociological and, and study of kind of culture and, and human uh, behavior is really, um, do we believe now that purpose and, and sort of having a job that also fulfills us um, in, uh, you know, it, perhaps one of our leisure activities that becomes then kind of a vocation. Um, is that something that is a new sort of phenomenon um, or is this something that we've been kind of uh, for the last several decades, we've kind of uh, come to believe. So the question is, you know, how deep is that? Is that sense, is it something that's really tied to um, our identity or is this part of kind of we're just swimming in these messages about the fact that our job has to be something that we love, which I think, you know, we could, we could certainly find evidence um, of that narrative. And so that's a real question I have. And I, I had one uh, reference that I wanted to share with folks uh, just who might be interested. Um, there's actually a book by a scholar named Brooke Aaron Duffy at Cornell University uh, called Not Getting Paid to Do What You Love. And she looks at aspirational work and for specifically Instagram influencers and really tries to understand, you know, what it means to balance, you know, uh, uh, something that's uh, a passion and whether or not it's, it's feasible to make a living um, in that way. And so I thought I would uh, share that with you all. On, the, on, the, on that same path, I would actually recommend um, Ermania Ibarra's Working Identity which actually kind of goes a bit of the other direction, not, not necessarily in terms of purpose, but about but the identity components of what, what we do, right? And how we shift, um, especially career transitions, right? How we shift from, I did this thing, now I've been through design graduate school and now I wanna do this thing. It's not a linear path, 
right? There are actually new stories each one of us have to tell about ourselves and get other people to tell about ourselves, right? As we make that transition. And she's one of the few, the first, I believe, kind of organizational psychologists to do some research and show that there's all these, there's, there's literally iteration, right? In that change. It's not like, oh, I'm here, I wanna to go to there. And there's a, a set of steps. A half of those steps are kind of internal about what, what we feel and how we talk about ourselves and, and how we get other people to talk about ourselves differently. I'm gonna pick up on a couple of the chat pieces here um, because I think that there's, um, uh, just to, Nicole mentioned that there are design strategists in HR 100%. They, like, like if any place that we belong, it's, it's there, right? That's the, the work of people. Um, but I think that this, this, this question about, about purpose in work, I'll pick back up on that really quickly, is, is one that to be a little bit, um, it's not that we shouldn't be value aligned with, with the person or the organization with whom we work, right? I think that that's very healthy. And I think having a passion for the work that you do, I think is also healthy. Um, but to remind ourselves, it's, 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 also, it's still work, right? There's a social construct uh, of the work. There's also a legal and contractual construct of the work that lies on top of that, right? And when we start relying on our work, not, I'm not talking about our colleagues, right? I'm talking about our work, our organization as to be our family. I think there's something a little bit that we should pull back and ask if that's the right place. We should be looking for that kind of connection. I'm not saying you can't have amazing teams, right? And amazing work experiences and, and real bonds. But some of the best, some of the best, most like, like highest points of my of my career have been working in amazing teams very intensely, and then it ends, right? Families don't necessarily end. F friends, you can be chosen family. I'm just saying the connections that you have emotionally outside your 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 place of work, where you're you're not getting paid, is a different is a different phenomena, right? And they can overlap, but understanding where those differences are, I think, is very important for one's own personal health. Um, I'll pick up a couple of the other things in the chat here. There is a question about culture, culture building when there's no there there and someone else, why would you go into the office? What experience do you wish for face-to-face? -face? Those feel part and parcel here. Um, you know, a place like, I'm gonna use Salesforce because it's because it is a very real estate heavy organization. The culture historically was held, has been held in its buildings. Um, and um, and so so we're asking this question now. What does it mean, right, for to 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 find and to build culture when when people aren't necessarily going into the office, or where we're now 60, 70,000 employees, um, twenty three thousand of those have been hired during COVID. Have never been to one of our buildings. They've never been to a, a boot camp or an onboarding, anything physical. Some of them haven't even met. Like I literally just met two, two members of my team about three weeks ago after they've been working for us for 18 months, right? And so what is this, what, is, what does it mean to build culture uh, or to hold culture, right? When, when there is no physical manifestation of that? I'm sure WordPress has some, something to say about this. Um, if w some of the thoughts that we're having, we don't have the answer yet, but I think there's a couple of different things. One is, what does it mean to like the, the opportunity to get together in an offsite capacity or in an onboarding kind of boot camp capacity? Those things, those opportunities take on new meaning, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is not just the op, like the, 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 the meaning of the opportunity, but literally how we fund those opportunities. If we're not putting money in real estate, what percentage of that should come off to expand, right? The time that we can be together in person, A. B, what are we doing when we're in person? Are we working or are we socializing? And what's that right mix before it would be like 80% work, 20% socialize? Hmm, is it really 50-50? And those are, those are the times that we actually are able to see each other and, and hold each other. Um, and what does it mean to be in an offsite where you actually have people that are there and people that are not there? What are the equity issues there? How do you design for time zones? What kind of new roles do you need to have? in that offsite, so there's an advocate for the people online. Uh, is the same 
the people online are literally sitting here with a camera. Does that mean the people that are also there should be sitting there with a camera so the people online can see them? Do you have other cameras that are bird's eye view so people at home can see, right? Everything that everyone else can see. Everyone else can see. These are design considerations, right? Of a hybrid experience. Um, and whether you, you know, GE had Crotonville and Deloitte has Deloitte University, those are those were places that were holders of culture, right? And now there's a new, a new set of those that are coming up in the world that I believe will be a place that instead of doing an offsite at a hotel, you might go to uh, a, a, a physical manifestation, right, of a culture, but you're just not going there every day. You're going there twice a year or three times a year in different off-site configurations. And so I think it's a great question. The other thing is, what is it? What are the rituals that one one one, meaning a team, can do right online that that hold culture or at least connection? Right. Someone mentioned that there was a managers need to be more intentional about their communication and clear about their expectations. Right. And so, what does it mean? How are we using you know team meeting time? And what is the first five meetings? Is, is the first five meetings of a meeting, minutes of a meeting, really just to say hello? Or are you starting the meeting five minutes after so everyone has time to take a break? But then it's really, the, it's all about the agreements, right? The social constructs that teams are now being able to make uh, really explicitly about their time and how that time gets used amongst the teams. Another really interesting dimension, if I can jump in, is that um, there's really good research that illustrates that um, things, especially things like disagreement, are much more difficult in virtual or remote work situations. And it's possible that we've learned, you know, in the last 18 months, maybe we've learned how to disagree better um, in remote situations. But historically, if you especially if you looked at global teams and the cultural differences bringing people from all over the world, it was very difficult for people to express when they disagreed with something. And that is uh, typically had been easier if you were in an in-person situation. And given how important critique is in the design field, like having feedback and really giving honest uh, perspectives on the work, I think that's, that's an area where we might want to think of it how can we create the right scaffolding for disagreement in remote uh, and distributed work? That's a good point. Um, no, I'm like simmering, I'm, I'm simmering on this idea. I'm, I'm also thinking like, is that happening because um, people are not having like that in-person interaction? So you can't see like the person's facial facial expression so there's like nothing like triggering any form of anger um like why is that happening uh on on a different note there was something that you both mentioned um about the great resignation and so like i i'm really interested in knowing like why or what's causing the great resignation and what may be the after effects like 50 something percent that's a lot <laughs> Yeah, I think this is a great um, discussion to have is, I mean, one of the things I'm observing as I'm watching how various organizations are responding to their employees, and I mean, this includes like major companies like Apple, um, you know, Google, and others, is that when um, there seems to be some, you know, employees, of course, during the pandemic, I think, you know, on very short notice, uh, learn to work remotely. And they did so under great duress, you know, having to take care of children and manage, you know, um, sometimes manage illness. Um, obviously, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And so what seems to be interesting to me is that companies are, uh, including, for example, major cities, you know, like calling their workers back to 100% in person, it's been done without a lot of attention and care to the sociological or cultural or psychological aspects. It seems to be more of a business decision that's driven more by legal and maybe economic considerations. Um, there's a great fear. Many organizations, I think it's an existential risk for them. They're very worried that if they're a little bit flexible on this, no one will ever show up again. But some people had to move you know, out of their primary residence to, to move across the country to take care of family members. Um, there are many reasons why people have 
perhaps, you know, when given uh, or when forced to have the flexibility, we're able to take advantage of that, um, maybe giving up one res residence where the rent was really high um, and moving to somewhere where they had a family home. So lots of reasons. Um, and so it's not easily to switch that back um, immediately. And of course, some companies have um, created more of a, a phased in policy where people go in, you know, little by little, and maybe in January, it's going to be several more days a week than it is today, or uh, going one or two days a week. And uh, so, so all of those have different assumptions built in. Um, like if you're assuming that everyone is still uh, within say one hour commute of your office, um, then that one model might work. Um, but if people have really distributed themselves all around the country, it's not gonna work. And it's gonna be, there's gonna be pushback because then there is a lot of friction in terms of moving back to the previous. Uh, so I think it has to be done with great care and with the, really with consulting of uh, people who have the sociological understanding or can quickly study what the current situation is for the employees at that organization. Um, but I'm very curious to hear what Teddy, um, uh, your response as well. Yeah, I think I'll say two things up front. <clears throat> you know, one, we're, we're we lot, right, are in a highly privileged position. Many people don't have this option to not go back to work or have had to go to work right throughout this whole time. So just to be clear that we recognize that we are talking about this, this population in our experience at the minute. Um, second, uh, when I hear uh, varying executives and managers talk and, and from different functions, right, talk about what they think is going to happen, it is almost universally uh, because of their own experience. Right, they had uh, uh, an aging parent, or they were uh, a, 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 a parent themselves with someone at home. We've, we've mentioned both those two. There are also lots of people who are single, who are very isolated at home, right? And so the, the, the range of experience is really significant. And my number one um, plea uh, to, these, to, these, to these folks is to, is to say, I, I respect your experience but it is one of many. And what we haven't really done is yet is the research, right? To look at, I don't know what the number is, but I'm, it's, it's easily a dozen different personas of major kinds of experiences, right? And when you take your own as the one that we're designing for, it, it's, not, it's not going to work, right? Second, there are a lot of um, companies who have an office open You'll hear this in the press, but that just means that a hundred people are going in a pilot experience, right? And, and in some places we've, we've put that location with all kinds of sensors and we're watching the data come off as to when people show up or they're coming on Tuesdays, but not on Thursdays, or they're coming in these parts of the day. But the end of that data is so small as to be irrelevant, right? It is interesting, but not something we should be making decisions upon. So in both of those cases, right, we have a an experience and, and a perspective and some interesting data. And we're trying to design the future with those things, as opposed to taking the proper step back, doing the design research that we all know how to do and moving forward from there. Because it will also be different by geography, by uh, industry, by function, by team. And this is a, so it's a much more nuanced question, uh, a much more complex question than we're seeing uh, people kind of tackle it with uh, so far. And so I would just kind of remind ourselves that, that the, the great resignation, I think is, is uh, it doesn't, on the other side, we don't, know, we don't know what's there yet, right? Like people are, some people are, a lot of people are resigning without a new job. It's just like I have a moment right here. I can take a break. I'm burnt out. I don't know what all this means. Um, it's it's what someone someone gave me a great analogy recently as to like you get a moment to like step back and be like, oh, I didn't really realize it could be a different way, and now we've all got a, a chance to say, oh, maybe it doesn't have to be nine to five. Maybe it could be from this state or whatever. And the the imagination, our imaginations have been reopened as to what and how work, what work is for and how we can do it. And so the, this reconfiguring is going to be a multi-year, right, um, um, 
process and evolution. So I think it's time. Yeah, That's sorry, Kristen, go ahead. I think you wanted to bring in some of the questions from the Q&A as well. We just have a few minutes left and we have some really good questions. So I just want to make sure to give these some time. So um, actually, Laura, um, maybe I can pose this one to you. Amanda has a great question here about how um, companies are thinking relative to childcare um, in connection with the great resignation and um, you know people and women in particular um, being able to return to the office. Um, do you have any thoughts there or uh, trends or thinking that you've seen in, in, in this area? Uh, that's, that's a really good question. I would say it's, it's I, I haven't followed the policies in particular. Of course, there are some organizations that do have childcare and universities are sometimes, um, you know, among those, I think uh, universities like Columbia University or perhaps Stanford, you know, these are the obviously very wealthy institutions or schools that have education schools often have childcare uh, just by virtue of the fact that they're, that's, that's one of their specialties. Um, I think with other kinds of employers, it's, it's much more difficult um, to assess because as we know, you know, uh, I think Teddy also mentioned that the workforce is composed of this uh, hybrid of, you know, people who are on contract, but working for large companies, full-time employees, um, freelancers, and, you know, lots of different uh, types of, of contracts. And, and so that, um, on the one hand, might make it more difficult to build the critical mass that you could meet, you know, need to provide such a, um, an amenity or service or obligation, depending on how you want to think about that. Um, and in this country, we just haven't had, I wouldn't say, a very good track record around those issues. I think in other countries, uh, we might look to models around the world where you know, there's a much more uh, government uh, responsibility in really taking care of early childhood um, education, um, child care, and things like that. Um, you know, people usually talk about Scandinavia, but I'm sure that's not one of the only places that, that where there's a lot more thought about families and really making the workforce a place where families can thrive. Yeah, I don't, I don't have um, specific answers or policy here. I just know that um, if we don't design the future of work for women, it, it kind of doesn't matter, right? We will, we will lose enormous uh, amounts of women in the workforce and all of the kind of diversity, equity and inclusion uh, as I say, progress, I'm not sure it's quite there, but aspirations, right, will, will, will be for naught. Um, and so in some ways, it's a, I don't, I'm, I'm hesitant to make this analogy, but, you know, we talk about extreme users, right? And I mean extreme in this sense, it's a positive, it's a positive here. Women in, in many cases are um, the, the, the still traditionally caregiver and backbone of of families, right? And if we don't design for, if we don't think about that as a, as a positive constraint designed to it, it really, it really doesn't matter. Um, and I think the smart companies will recognize that it'll become uh, a competitive advantage from a, from a talent attraction and retention standpoint, and we'll see that. There have been some interesting experiments um, around job sharing um, that I think are really, uh, that are, that are, you know, this is not just for women. I, I, I know a, a, a man and a woman who share a job um, and it requires a lot of uh, sophistication in terms of kind of your emotional intelligence and communication. But when you get it right, you know, I, I would work four days a week or three and a half days a week, right? Like, and so I think we're going to see a lot of this, um, a lot of innovation here. It's going to take some time. Um, but I think that that's where we're, we're headed. And the, the challenge, again, for us designers is to think about it in terms of a, a series of, of, of design constraints in the most positive a way that we need to design to and for and, and actually with, right? So. So Teddy, um, specific question, I think for you here about, um, you, you spoke earlier about design strategists and, and the need for them. Can you talk about what, um, what you mean by design strategists specifically at Salesforce? This, um, this uh, question is coming from Naomi and she seems, she sees that uh, different organizations define it differently. Yeah. I think this is a relatively nascent um, job title description, or let's call it immature. It's been around for a long time, but it is immature at any kind of scale. Um, and so I would say that there are um, 
there are a, a handful of descriptors, right? That 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 pull in here. So when when we he, when on the product side, right? You typically have an engineer, a designer, and a project and a product manager. The engineer's job is to figure out how to code it. The product manager is to figure out the business uh, rationale for that, and the designer is the the human advocate in the system, right? Um, in that tri in that historic triangle, we don't really have someone to say what should be built, and that is the job of, of, a, of a design strategist, right? It's someone who works with research to understand what the need is, and then those three people can figure out the best way to make it. And so there's a, a role in there that 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 and it's also typically quite forward looking. It's not it's not a futurist. Right, but having some background in foresight and some and some tooling around foresight is very helpful. That's a specific example in a product context. Um, we have uh, design strategists in the more IDEO sense uh, or frog sense, where you we have a customer, they're customer facing, they're working with a researcher and a designer in a in a designer in a sense of someone who can articulate and make. Uh, artifact to communicate, right? Um, working with a researcher, a design researcher, and a strategist. And the strategist, the design strategist, their job there is to understand the business of our customer and understand what the potential user experience could, should be, similar to what a design strategist, what the potential product could, should be. But this is a user experience or product for a customer, right? And then work with the design researcher and the designer to articulate what that is. So they're creating a vision and a conceptual design, maybe down into some wireframes, but that their job is, is to, is to ima help imagine, some executives imagine and articulate through artifacts, right? What that thing is, that's a, that's a design strategist. I think we might have um, something kind of similar in the, in the marketing realm where you're uh, really thinking about the, the this, the brand strategy, right? But like a, like a level up from what campaign I'm going to run to what is it that I'm trying to express as the brand of either Salesforce or again, one of our customers. So those are places. And then there's a, a fourth where you're seeing agencies, um, not external, but we have, a, we have a, a services agency internally. And there are design strategists in there who will take some of that conceptual design and 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 go deeper on it right and then take that all the way through implementation and so often these positions are they're translators right they're imaginers of the future and translators into operationalization or 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 making um, in in really in all of those cases that's what and so you need to speak a couple of different languages right design and, or design and or business and or research and or UX, right? Like you, you need two uh, in that pie shaped to be able to be an effective um, kind of design strategist. Great, so we have, um, let's see, I'm gonna try and, and get another question in here. I know we're at time, but I wanna just close with one more question um, that Laura, hopefully um, you could speak to a little bit with your kind of looking at the, the future of work writ large a bit more. Um, I'm gonna probably mispronounce your name, Ayush, I'm sorry. Um, but just as, as you were talking about earlier, Teddy, that we need to have designers in kind of all these various areas of an organization. Um, as designers come into more high pressure industries like investment banking, law, other areas, um, what does the future of work look like in those, in those industries? Are, are there things that you can kind of point out or demarcate as being different there or other trends that you might see there? So this, this is specific to designers working in um, those industries, is that correct? Well, I mean, if you have thoughts otherwise, I, I, I felt like that would be kind of the, the thrust of the question here, but maybe I'm reading into it a bit too much. It's a, it's a really good question. Um, you might have seen some of the, I think there's some reporting a couple of weeks ago about how we often see, for example, 
pictures in the news about trading rooms that still show us like a floor full of traders. And that actually bears absolutely no resemblance to what actually happens today. It's more like um, a server farm or a building full of computers, you know, that make up our financial markets. Of course, um, it seems to me that investment banking, you know, has, is still for the most part uh, remote. Uh, what I remember uh, from my, some of my early research on remote work was that law was one of the professions that was highly tied to material objects, especially files and paper. And so it's like one of the fields that still was using the fax machine up until a couple of years ago, may still use it even now. Um, and that, you know, the, the most, uh, for someone that I interviewed years ago, who was a lawyer working remotely, he said the most difficult thing was that his entire living room filled up with green file folders. And that, that was why it made it difficult for him to work in a distributed uh, way. So, so I think that each industry is very unique um, and that we'd have to do that research today to, or, or, or at least be in more community with pe people who are working in those industries. And I only know a handful of people um, just as, as friends or colleagues, but uh, I wouldn't be able to really uh, understand necessarily the full um, experience of, of that industry in terms of remote work. Okay. And then just one last question. I think actually this one from Lee, Teddy, you kind of answered a little bit earlier in the presentation when you were um, talking about the different missteps that uh, different organizations have taken in, in, in terms of um, having people re return to work in the office. And I think as we know, you know, some organizations are having people return to the office at different levels. And um, so there's a whole different uh, set of things going on there. But what we did also talk about earlier, I think um, was a question that you had had, Manny, um, about IDEO, but I can't actually remember it specifically. And I wondered if maybe we could close there um, as, as you're just with, with a question kind of about the search and about looking at jobs. And, and um, so can you rephrase that or remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, so I was asking Teddy, I was like, I am a huge IDEO fan. But I've been waiting for like a job offer to come up and I haven't seen anything. And then just when I saw one like five days ago, I looked online and it's gone. And it's like, oh, we need um, a business designer to work in Tokyo or Shanghai. And I don't want to move to Tokyo. Um, so like, how do I like really find jobs that are, you know, in tune with, you know, sort of that ideal style of working? Yeah, my so the thing I was just saying was, you know, there is a. <clears throat> uh, I'm I'm pleased to have been there for a couple of years, right? It was it really it was it was amazing, and it probably was three or four years of like talking to people, and eventually there was an opportunity. So you should know for that company specifically, there there is amazing work. Um, it has you know a mythology that is that is. Um, you know, like like most mythologies, there's some truth and and some and some not. Um, it is tiny, right? It's 700 people, and so there are hundreds of thousands of design jobs these days. At one point, that you know, you, you needed to go through an IDO or a frog, and these days, so many people from IDO or frog are now in business and understand what that is. This is a this is a decade old phenomenon, right? It's not. It didn't. This was not true seven years ago or ten years ago. And so like, don't set your sets on IDEO. You're probably not going to work there and that's more than okay. Um, and there are lots of, you should like, you know, there are more people, there are probably, uh, there are probably four times as many people that have worked at IDEO than that currently work at IDEO. Go find them. That's what is my advice to you, so. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Good luck, everybody. Thank you all for being here tonight and um, happy ConFan. Uh, we have another event coming up on October 20th, which will be moderated by Laura. Um, and it's on this question, which we actually mentioned tonight, what should we make? Um, so that's going to be really exciting. We have um, three panelists joining her. You can go to our website to learn a bit more about it. And I hope you will register and join us. Thanks again. Thanks and good luck this week, everyone. Great Thank to see you. so many alumni and current and former students and friends. Mm -hmm.